Time to recap, I guess, the week that was uh, with this show trial, this uh, farcical hearing in Vancouver as uh, McLean's Magazine and Mark Stein unofficially were, were dragged before the B.C. Human Rights Tribunal uh, to answer for themselves the alleged crime or the crime was uh, McLean's Magazine having run a book excerpt from uh, America Alone written by Mark Stein. And it was a, a most bizarre week at times. And we had a chance to speak with Mark Stein the other night on the program, get some thoughts from him on all of this. As strange as it was, though, we may be seeing more of this. In fact, uh, right here in Alberta, where we seem to be inching our way toward the actual trial stage in the human rights complaint that was filed against uh, the now defunct Western Standard Magazine. Joining us to talk about all of this, someone who was at the center of one of these stories and was uh, looking in on the other. Ezra Levant is the uh, former publisher of the Western Standard. He's a lawyer, a columnist, much more at EzraLevant.com. Ezra, welcome back to the program. Oh, it's great to be back. Thank you. All right. Well, first of all, the, uh, the the trial in Vancouver, you were there for the first couple of days. And obviously, with, with having a legal background, you got a kind of a different perspective on all of this. What were your impressions? What, what stood out to you in those first couple of days? Well, um, you're, you're correct to say I'm a lawyer, and I've been in plenty of courtrooms, including uh, civil courts, small claims court, <laughs> traffic court, yeah. and criminal courts. Um, this was not a court. Rob, it, it was in a building that said court on the door, and okay. um, there were three people at the at the front who looked like they might be judges, but it was no court. It was a counterfeit court, because courts don't do what these three nut bars do. Let me give you an example. Um, in real courts, when you're accused of something, you're allowed to know the case against you. That That's it seems pretty natural. I mean, if you're accused of something, you get to know in advance what you're accused of. That didn't happen here. The Canadian Islamic Congress was springing documents on McLean's that they were intended to use as proof of uh, the hate crime uh, the night before they were introduced, sometimes the day of. In real trials, you get to know what witnesses are going to be called against you. Again, even as the trial had begun, uh, the Canadian Islamic Congress had not told the accused who their witnesses would be. Um, when, when someone testifies, they're not allowed to give what's called hearsay evidence. You have to go straight to the source. Hearsay evidence was allowed. Uh, experts uh, have to have a certain level of expertise. Here, non-experts were giving um, uh, testimony, uh, irrelevant testimony. It, it was, I've seen better procedure in barroom discussions than I did in this rogue court. And the nuttiest of all was the fact that the uh, uh, that the chief complainant here, Mohammed El Masri, the bigoted president of the Canadian Islamic Congress, the man who started this all, never showed his face. And here's the, Rob, you're not going to believe what I'm about to say, but I swear it's true. He didn't testify, but he sent in someone to give his testimony for him, some Toronto law student named Kurma One, who's not a complainant, who doesn't live in B.C., who isn't an expert in anything. Mohammed El Masri sent in basically an actor, to give his testimony for him. This was not a court, Rob. This was a kangaroo court of the worst order. But but that's not even the worst of it. Because let's say that instead of a, a, a kangaroo lawless court, you actually had rules of law. And let's say instead of three radical Marxist activists judging the thing, let's say you actually had three legal scholars who knew about things like freedom of speech. It still would be abominable. Because it's abominable that a government would seek to rule on whether or not we're allowed to have this opinion or that one. And that's the problem. It's not just the kangaroo court. It's not just the strange and bizarre Soviet-style hearing. That's disgusting, too. But it's the fact that even if it was a perfect court, they don't have the right to ask us what our opinions are and tell us that we're right or wrong. That's not Canadian, Rob. That's Soviet. That's Maoist. That's North Korean. That's Iranian. That's Saudi Arabian. That is not Canadian values. And the Canadian Islamic Congress is importing their Saudi values to Canada, and the government of B.C. is letting them. It was ironic about it. There, there were many ironies, many of them tragic. But Mark Stein it, it w- was not allowed to get on the stand and say, here was my intent. Here, here's why I wrote this. Here's what I was trying to accomplish. Here's where I, I feel I'm right. Here's where I feel I've got truth on my side. He was not allowed to do any of that. Yet through the proceedings, you have the Canadian Islamic Congress trying to read in 
to uh, what Mark Stein's intent was, trying to read into why he wrote these words or why he wrote this as he wrote it, and even calling witnesses to show that, that he was wrong about this or wrong about that. When oh, it's worse. Rob, they even had this witness, this, uh, this law student I talked about. He gave testimony about whether or not Mark Stein's jokes were funny. <laughs> I heard Mark Stein made a comment, I'm not sure where, that maybe uh, this kid, Kurma Wan, wants to be uh, paid to be Mark Stein's joke tester. So I can picture a society run by these human rights commissions. Okay, give it to the official joke tester. Try this one. Does he laugh? No, he doesn't think it's funny. Okay, that one's illegal. I mean, what the heck's going on here? But you raise a good point. McLean's actually didn't lead any witnesses of their own. No one. Not the editor, not the publisher, not Mark Stein. Why? Because the law doesn't require them to be irresponsible uh, to, to convict them. And on the other hand, if they prove that they were reasonable and accurate and factual and fair, that doesn't exculpate them either. Now, defamation law, like if I were to say, Rob Breckenridge stole my wallet, he's a crook. I'm allowed to say that if I can prove it's true. I'm allowed to say that hurtful thing about you, Rob, if I can prove it's true. And that's good because that allows us to criticize public figures and have a healthy debate, but it also protects your reputation in case I'm lying. And, and journalism works fairly well with our defamation laws. If, if I were to say that and you were to sue me in defamation, I'd have to prove that I got my facts right and, and if I had any opinions, they were fair. But those defenses, truth, and fair comment do not apply in this hate speech trial. And that's why Mark Stein did not try to argue that he was truthful or reasonable. That he didn't try to, because even if he could prove it was true, it's not relevant. And even if the Canadian Islamic Congress could, quote, prove that he was a meanie, prove that his facts were false, and they didn't, by the way, that wouldn't matter, because I'm going to read to you the exact wording of this, of this Stalinist law. I know it from memory because I've seen it so many times that I myself am charged with it. Here's the exact wording. It's illegal to publish anything that is, quote, likely to expose a person or persons to hatred or contempt. Truth is not a, So, for example, if you had a, a documentary on the Holocaust that was true, but if it exposed Germans to hatred or contempt, that could be a hate crime. If you go to the movie Pearl Harbor... And it, which is based on a true story. And if you start to feel angry about Japan, that's a hate crime, even though it's yeah. true. Because fair, common, and truth are not a defense. This is Stalinist, Rob. And you can go write uh, anonymously on some blog that I saw Pearl Harbor, and boy, I don't like Japanese folks. Now, I guess they, they'll pull that in as evidence, right? Well, and, and there's one more difference. Let's say I, I said you stole my wallet, and you proved I was lying. Then you would have to show the court that you, you were damaged, and, and I'd have to pay you back to make you right. That's not necessary here. No damages need to be proved for McLean's to get convicted. So they bring in this law clerk from Toronto who's never set foot in B.C. before. He gives testimony. I don't quite know why. He doesn't think Mark Stein's funny. No damage is shown. No one, should, no one showed, well, you know, my house was burned down or I lost my reputation. Not, that's not, it's, so there's no rules that any normal, you don't, have to be in, you don't have to be a lawyer to know this is insane. It helps because I was rolling my eyes the whole time at, at these kangaroos running this thing. It's scary, but, you know, it's happening here in Alberta, too. And I'm not just talking about myself. Just last week, Rob, a Christian pastor named Stephen Bazan got his sentence. You might recall that last November he was convicted yep. of exposing gay people to hatred or contempt because he criticized homosexuality. He's a Christian pastor. So last week the Alberta Human Rights Commission gave their order to him. You know what their punishment was? He is banned for the rest of his life from disparaging gays. And they use that exact word, disparaging. So this isn't even about reaching a level of hate speech now or a hate crime. This Christian pastor is not allowed to say anything critical at all about homosexuality for the rest of his life. And I read the order and I posted it on my website, EzraVant.com. Check it out if you think I'm fibbing because it's so crazy it sounds like I'm making this up, isn't it, Rob? Yeah. 